This is CRM Audio, the Microsoft Dynamic CRM Podcast, with George Dubinsky, Joel Lindstrom, and Sean, the CRM Hobbit Haber. Guys, if I'm a little bit more relaxed today, it's because I'm on I'm on vacation, so it's not the normal stressed out Joel that's all business. This is the PTO Joel, the, the the laid back. Imagine me sitting on a beach right now. So so wait, you're telling me there's a all business Joel? <laughs> yes, exactly. Oh yeah, uh, I'm all business. Okay, all right. Well, good. good. Congratulations. <laughs> I'm going to beautiful scenic Charleston, South Carolina, uh, home to historic sites, beautiful beaches, and and people who think like the rest of the state of South Carolina doesn't exist. Nice, very nice. Sean, you've been doing some travel. Are um, you taking your family with you? I'm or taking you... my family, my wife, my kids, and the dog. Wow, taking the dog, yeah. that's commitment right there. The dog, has, the dog has never seen the beach. Oh, that'll be fun. So That'll be fun for your kids and for the dog. Yeah, my son's never been to the beach either. Um, so, Sean, you've been traveling this week, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> Went to uh, beautiful Walla Walla, Washington. I, bet I the, would just uh, walk around all the time saying Walla 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 Walla. Well, here's a fun fact. Um, while um, while working on my my implementation, I was uh, happy in the fact that uh, one of the main residents of Walla Walla, Washington, is none other than um, Adam West, TV's Batman, <laughs> and uh, okay. he he has a, he has a uh, winery in uh, Walla Walla. So, did you stop by and see him? Well, you know, I heard that I heard a rumor that there was a Batman statue in Walla Walla, so I was I was literally looking all over for the statue, and I asked um, my client. I said, "Hey, uh, where's that? Where's the Batman statue?" And I could have said, "Hey, why are you purple and green?" Because the look I w- received was, "There's no Batman statue. I don't know what you're talking about." And, and George, you've lived to see another episode, I see. Yeah, except uh, uh, I've got a bit sore throat uh, mornings. It's getting cold in Sydney because it's uh, winter time. Uh, so now I can, after visiting my client, I can say like brains. <laughs> <laughs> so what does what does cold mean in Sydney, Australia? What does it mean when um, it's cold? Ooh, in your speak. Cold um, at night, it gets to, let me calculate uh, quickly, to 18, uh, 50. Okay. So Florida. Uh, so it's about 10, 10 Celsius at night, and it gets to about, on a cold day, to about 16, 17, um, 17 18. Um, so it gets to about 60 plus in Fahrenheit. That's it. But once you live in the cli- climate like that, I mean, anything anything below 65 or 20 Celsius, like, it's cold. It's funny that you mentioned that your kids never seen an ocean. My kids, I grew up in a climate where there's the snow and ice hockey and all sort of stuff. But uh, uh, until a certain time ago, uh, my kids haven't seen the snow. So when I've taken them to the snow, uh, that was like the first time they've seen the snow. Ocean, they've seen it from the age of 10 days. I'd like to say a special hello to our two listeners in Belarus. Did you want me to do it in Belarusian? Yeah, could you, Sean, would you, would you greet our Belarusian listeners? Hello, Belarusian listeners. <laughs> There you go. So on our agenda for today, you have a lot of good things for this podcast. I think we'll talk about some news. We'll talk about some things from the, the tip of the day. And then we will hopefully have our first guest. We hope to bring in some interesting or hopefully interesting guests during our podcast. We'll, ch- we'll try me, to see how it goes. Hopefully. 
I thought that you screened your guests before inviting I them. I screen them, but you know, you can't always be you can't always be sure. I I am very sure that our guests will be it will be interesting. So I guess to start off, first topic that is kind of pressing on a lot of people's minds is update one, and uh, we've had update one for new environments for about three weeks now. I've been playing, I played with it a lot. Have have kind of our first project going where we're where we're implementing that. So it's exciting to see all all the new stuff there, but. I I, I hear a lot of confusion about the upgrade process uh, because, uh, for one thing, uh, if you go to your CRM, to your Office 365 portal and schedule the up, upgrade, you'll see uh, it, it's defaulting to something like October, November for most orgs. And people are asking, I thought this was the spring update. <laughs> Why am I getting it in the fall? And you can reschedule it. But the earliest you can schedule it is is July. I think July 15th or 20th is 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 the first time. Which, again, is frustrating if you're really ex- like me. If you're really excited to get the new UI, uh, you're really excited about that. I kind of can know why that is. If you remember back, guys, a year ago or two years ago when 2013 came out, when they upgraded people, they scheduled them like right away. And we had a lot of complaints about that. So I think Microsoft has learned their lesson that they are they're trying to be a little bit more flexible. And if, if you don't want to schedule it, you don't have to. But um, I think we're getting kind of the opposite feedback here. Of, I want it earlier. <laughs> yeah, if memory serves, we had we had the exact opposite complaint with 2013. It was I want to schedule it out farther instead of I want to bring it in sooner. Because I'm not ready, so maybe 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 our uh, customers have learned. Yeah, but that was a big that. change. Remember, 2013 yeah. was a big change. Whilst here, it's uh, incremental. It's like a lot of new stuff within the same framework. But Joe, you you work with the large number of uh, organizations online, probably within the same uh, tenant. How does that work when some of your orgs are on update one and some of them aren't? Do you lose functionality, like ability to copy organization one into another? Not, not really, but the way it works is when you copy an org, whatever version it's on is what the copied org gets. So, like, it doesn't matter if, if, you're, if your sandbox is on update one and you restore a backup uh, of your production environment that's on 2015, you're, it's going to be a 2015 environment. Or if you copy, if you still have a 2013 environment and you, you copy it over it, it'll Okay, but it. can you bump it up? Like no. if you have... No, and that's, a- that's, here's, here's <laughs> the kind of whammy that I'm, I'm in. I have my production organization scheduled for July 20th. And so I wanted to schedule my sandbox for a week or two before that. Um, not expecting huge differences, but just give, give us enough time to test it out. I did, but now my sandbox, I don't have the option to schedule it. I don't know how exactly how that works, but one thing to be aware of, you know, if you're scheduling your update you're, and you're going to want to have a current copy of your, a current sandbox copy of your production environment, you need to go ahead and make a copy like now because it's not going to instantly allow you to schedule the update. And you can't choose when I copy this over, I want to upgrade it. Yeah, it could get very confusing. I think it's uh, very challenging right now for ISVs. As you know, some of our friends who are large ISVs, they, they very much, uh, I wouldn't say upset, but um, they a bit stressed with the current situation when they cannot test. Oh, sure. I, I know that people uh, like, Sham, like Sham MacArthur are, have some angst going on right now, especially around the new rendering engine, because you're right, it's not as major as 2011 to 2013 was, but that new rendering engine is going to impact JavaScript and other form components, and you're going to want to test it. Now, you, good thing is you can turn it off, but it's not perform. It's per it's it's off or on for everything. Mm, indeed. So it is challenging. I think uh, if you if you have uh, the advice would be if you uh, if you have multiple organizations, multiple sandboxes, then uh, do some reading and uh, even I would raise support ticket to make sure that uh, my orgs are updated in the sequence that I want. Like in your case, wouldn't it be helpful to actually swap production for the sandbox? Can you do that? You mean make your production environment a sandbox? 
Yeah, well, and sandbox your production. Yeah, I mean, you 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 could do that. Um, my only concern there would be my experience is sandbox orgs typically get um, typically get a little bit lower performance than, uh, for example, I, mean, I can demonstrably show if I log into my sandbox, forms load a little bit slower there. So I think it's a different different grade or different service level. Oh, different scale group, probably. Yeah, probably, yeah. probably different scale group, exactly. Ah, uh, okay. So, I mean, my, my advice to people would be, if you want to get the update and you want to test now, go ahead and schedule and, and refresh your sandbox now, because it's going to be a little bit of time before you can schedule the upgrade in your sandbox, and you're going to want to do that before. Um, one other thing is, and, and, and we do have customers, too, especially large enterprise customers, who haven't upgraded to 25th haven't upgraded 2015 yet their upgrade is still scheduled in the future and one thing that i i didn't realize you could do until recently is you can actually skip 2015 and go directly to 2015 update one so if you have a a, a, a future upgrade to from 2013 to 2015 online you can go change the version and go right to 2015 update one and so if, if you're in that camp and haven't done that, I would probably recommend you do that. Of course, get your sandbox scheduled first. There's no reason you have to go to 2015 first. You can go directly to 2015 Update 1. Don't you think that given the rapid release cycle that we're having now online, you'll see more of that? You going, you know, Not going one after the other, but going maybe two and sometimes three releases before you actually get it. Yeah, I, th- I think so. And, and kudos to Microsoft for... Giving the flexibility, so we're. I think we're almost to the point where managing organizations and refreshes is as easy or easier with online as it is with on premise. It didn't used to be that way, but now that we've got the ability to a little bit more flexibility on delaying the upgrades, and we mm-hmm. can refresh the sandbox. I've got, I mean, I've got a. I I've can't a, wait. Uh, I can't wait for lifecycle services, uh, which is coming later this year when. Uh, You'll have ability to take your on-prem infrastructure and move it to Azure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And with uh, the idea is that it will be very easy to do with uh, one button push. Yeah, it will pre- reprovision all your services and so forth. So I can't, I can't wait for that because for us, uh, we are hosting partner, and for us, I know I'm gonna sleep better knowing <laughs> that uh, I don't have physically to go into data center. It's probably a topic for the next uh, for the next podcast. I can take about thirty minutes to tell how I ended up spending about six hours uh, in the data center over the uh, two days uh, this week. That was fun. Wow! Besides besides camping out in the data center and sleeping at the cemetery, you have an exciting life, George. It all boils down to I curse English language. Uh, I know that for certain that in a lot of languages. You, when you say your name, you don't have to spell it. <laughs> right? English is the only language where you have to spell everything. Oh, I took my dog for a walk. Oh, dog, how do you spell it? <laughs> you know, wh- one of my developers kept referring to a branch. And I said, why are you talking about food? And he said, no, 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 branch as in, in the source control system. And I said, oh, you mean branch with an A, not you. We had one, of the, one of the MVP summits, Neil Benson, he's from Ireland, was talking about case management. And the whole time I thought he was talking about kiss management because he said kiss. <laughs> <laughs> so I, with my surname, I have to spell it. And unfortunately, uh, I had to learn, you know, Alpha Bravo Charlie thing because I can't even... They they managed to write it down incorrectly when I spell it. So it's so let's uh, let's go back to CRM. Microsoft's done extremely good job with update one, like uh, the features, and then I see videos coming up. It just video came out today, and Mark Smith posted it. I for the first time I was disappointed that there's no dislike button in Facebook because those videos they literally do a disservice to the product. It's kind of it's one-sided, it's very one-sided concentrating on opportunities. And then yeah, okay, I I buy that. You you sell your product on opportunity management. That's fine. 
But then this gentleman in the video goes in and says, oh, look how easy, how easy it is for me to do a reporting. And guess what he pulls out? He pulls out a built-in report, which was created like, what, seven years ago? Well, that wasn't and, that wasn't a Microsoft video. That's a I, th- I, th- I think that's a uh, that's a partner produced video. Is it? That's a serum in a day, which is I think it's. A it's partner. a partner. I thought that's a Microsoft reserved. Uh, yeah, no, I that yeah. I saw it as well, and I mean, I think I I think it uh, I, I get what it was trying to do, but I mean that, the the important uh, the discussion there that I think for us I don't know, call us old timers. Some of us are some of us timers are older than others, but um, you know I think I think it, it's kind of the and I think we'll get into this with the USD discussion of. We are think XRM, and we think yeah, it's not just sales, marketing, whatever. But if you look at what analysts look for and what a lot of customers are looking for, when they look at CRM, they're still looking at those sales, marketing, service type type buckets. So I think Microsoft has to straddle that line of we need to be best of breed in these areas, but we also need the strong developer platform, the strong XRM. Oh, I totally agree. I mean, the, the most upsetting thing in this video was this uh, use of sample data, which has like five opportunities, and then drawing chart on that, uh, you know, which has three columns, uh, two, one, and three uh, values in each. Uh, it just doesn't show the product. I mean, well, and, you know, George, you're, 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 with the you're, decent data sets. You're right that it, it does it does disservice in that respect, but coming from from that that partner, I'm not sure who it is, but that may be just a replication of a of a sales approach that they do, and it works for them, and their audience likes those videos. Yeah, it really, you got to really with CRM. I agree. I would love to see a lot of innovation and a lot of creativity when I look at videos online instead of just the canned speeches. But that's I guess that's what we're here for. Yeah, I'm looking at that now, and that was the video for the price of a of a cup of coffee per user or whatever, which I didn't know if was that expensive Civic Cat coffee or what. But yeah, what, that's expensive what, coffee. What they're going for is quick, cheap, out-of-the-box yep. type implementations, which is totally different exactly. probably than what any of us are, are shooting for. I think, I think exactly. there's a place for that with very small companies and things like that, but it's not very interesting to me. That's a to- totally uh, separate subject of uh, decent data sets especially if you're doing reporting, uh, Power BI, and things like that. But uh, it's a topic for another day. You were going to talk to us about RAM for good. You know what? Until about three weeks ago, when people mentioned, oh, mobile for good, and I thought, yeah, good, it's good. It's like, it didn't <laughs> yeah, even occur like to good, me. It's like, they had a good yeah, app. It, it's like a, it's a nice. It's a, it's a model is good. It's, right. Yeah. So tip four hundred one is what you're talking about, and I I did this because you know there's a lot of I get a lot of questions about this, especially working in the enterprise space because mobile security. When you're working with the bank, when you're working with an insurance company, financial services, etc. Good or something like good is widely used. But you have to explain that good. It's a product. It's good technologies. Right. I don't say the, the good. A, the good. Yeah. Yeah, CRM it's app not, because it confuses people. It's good with capital G. It's, it's, and so yes, that's it's, one of the things that you know a lot of people are excited about with the latest release, but there's not a lot of clear information about that. So what I what I like to do, one of the things that I love doing with tip of the day is clearing up confusion. And especially when I hear the same question in the forums or someplace over and over, I know there's got to be a lot of a lot of uh, confusion about this. Part of the confusion, I think, comes from this is kind of a joint venture between Microsoft and Good. And so it's like you can't get all the information in one place. Microsoft documents part of it. Good documents part of it. But if you want to get the whole story, it's kind of like you got to talk to somebody from Good. you got to talk to somebody from Microsoft. So I have several customers who are going through that, and so I kind of documented in Tip 401 what you really need to know. And the biggest point of confusion that actually some of our customers have gotten some misinformation about is the Good version of the mobile app is the same thing as the I don't want to say non-good version of the mobile app, but it's the same version as the regular mobile app. And so what that means is 
all the stuff you got to have to use mobile if you're on premises, including IFD, you still have to have with good. A lot of people think, oh, it's, it, it uses uh, good technologies. That means good will be authenticating you to CRM. Um, not exactly. Good doesn't authenticate to CRM. Good simply provides verification through good that the you know, you're authorized before letting you use it. And if you're a bank or somebody, you'll have a device that's locked down and you can only install apps that are approved through the good cloud. So users can't go and do that. Another point is, well, if I have IFD, what prevents somebody on their home iPad from pulling up the app store and getting the regular app? And one thing you can do, and I actually, in the tip 401, I put a video from Convergence with Best Sankey that showing you can actually set up your firewall and proxies such that you can't connect to CRM outside your network except through the good proxy. I'm not a good expert, but having experienced this or worked with it a couple times, I just wanted to provide kind of the bullet points of here's the basics you need to know so so you can fairly evaluate this and, and implement it without running into some of the brick walls. Just very similar to why I wrote the mobile survival guide is, you know, there's just a lot of things that I feel aren't documented or nuances where something works a little bit differently in mobile versus versus the normal applications. And I think that's a great addition for especially like uh, financial services firms and others, although most of the customers I've run into where they've used good, they don't want to go IFD. So that'll be right. – I haven't implemented that yet. So it'll be interesting to see how that, uh, how that change goes. So what goes, do they do instead? How they don't go outside at all? Many or? times they tell their users you can't use mobile, <laughs> or, yeah. which is not a good one. Or you try and put the, put the device on some kind of VPN, then you can do use regular claims without having to expose things externally. But right. I think I think at least – Having an option to where, yes, you're using IFD, but you're, you have to be connected to the good proxy. That'll give them a little bit more thing. But many of them, because of all the banks that have been hacked and things like that, have blanket rules. No internal systems can touch the internet. The fact that with IFD, we, we have to not only expose the IFD server, we also have to expose, you know, the CRM server. Even through an ADFS proxy, they're not hot about that. Well, that kind of makes sense. Um, if I had the liability concerns that a bank has or something like that, I would probably have the same policy. You know, with the browser, I can configure my server. Uh, you've seen my tips where I, um, you can actually use a multiple IIS servers and redirect requests, right. which allows you to maintain supported uh, uh, CRM server. At the same time, you can do things like IP filtering and what's not. Uh, one of the things you can do uh, on this um, proxy IAS is um, uh, demand certificates from the client. So all your clients, say you, you can request X509 from them. So only authorized clients with the certificates installed will be able to connect to your CRM. How does, does that work on things apply? like iPads and phones and stuff? Is, yeah, is exactly. That that was my question. Does it work at all? I don't. I don't think so. I mean, it's such a, you have so many more limits from what you can do. I mean, even VPN on a on a phone isn't isn't the same thing as VPN on a computer. So you know, and and the the thing to keep coming back to is none of the apps, phone, Outlook, tablet, will work. Um, will work without an IFD connection if you're not on the network. If you've been on the network, you have to have claims. So, yeah, you could do all the browser, you can do all kinds of stuff, and even. No, no, I'm not saying that you don't have to have claims. What I'm saying, in addition to claims, after you've done your claims, you connect to CRM server. I'm saying I can accept only connection from the clients who have certificate installed. And that works for the browsers extremely well. Now, I'm not sure how does it work for Outlook or Mobile. Used, um, I have used, a v, put it this way, I haven't done that. I've used VPN plus internal claims and on, a, on an iPad been able to connect. And that is a supported scenario. So if you have a VPN on there, I'm not sure, you know, that the approach you're talking about, I've just never tried it. Sounds like it should mm-hmm. work, but, you know, again, the, the requirement is the CRM for X requires claims. Well, and then that's where that's where instead of IFD, 
you might look at you might try to look at online a little more and show the credentials that that, that exist for their security and and reliability. So it's a, it's a it's a trade off. Some some banks will just want to stay completely on premise, and it's going to be interesting in the future as we get more and more features and functionality on online. Not to say that on uh, on prem is going to be deprecated, but what that value option is for the for the client online versus on-prem, how that changes. Let's talk about, let's make this a topic for next week because I think this is a really good topic for, it's really, really timely at this. Yeah, indeed. And now it's time for George Dubinsky's Developer's Minute. Today's topic uh, in Developer's Minute is sample, create a basic plugin in Dynamic CRM 2015. C sharp. Using space system semicolon character term. Using space system dot service model semicolon carriage return. Carriage return. Forward slash forward slash. Microsoft space dynamic space CRM space namespace. Opening bracket S closing bracket. Carriage return using space microsoft.xrm.sdk semicolon carriage return namespace space microsoft.crm.sdk dot samples carriage return curly bracket carriage return tab public space class space follow up plugin space i plugin carriage return tab curly bracket Tab, tab, forward slash, forward slash, forward slash, less sign, summary, greater than sign, carriage return. I think that's all we have time for today. This has been George Dubinsky's Developer's Minute. Join us next time to hear George say, colon, not semicolon. Joining us now is our first special guest, Wayne Walton. Wayne is a uh, architect with Hitachi Solutions. He works with Sean and I. Welcome, Wayne. Howdy. Nice to be here. And Wayne, uh, meet George Dubinsky. George is in Sydney, Australia. And uh, I think I mentioned to you, when you talk to George, just think opposite. It's nighttime and winter there. It's daytime summer here. So then you'll understand. Good evening, then. Good evening. And uh, if you talk backwards, it will be fine. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and, and Wayne is joining us because he has written a good blog post about the Unified Service Desk. And one of the things we like to do is cut through confusion, and I find a lot of confusion out there about the USD. It's the way it's presented is basically as a call center agent desktop. But at what we'll talk about, there's a lot more that you can do with it, and it's, it's really more than that. George, you had a question for us first. Yes, you're all Hidachi guys, and you have this Sumo Sun. You <laughs> carry it around, and you take photos and place the doll, I assume, in all the surprising places. It's what, not what's a doll, story? it's an action figure. It's <laughs> an action figure. Yeah, I, Wayne, Wayne, as our special guest, why don't you take that one? Well, Sumo Sun, actually, that's a question I don't know the answer to. To. I like Sumo San. He's a great mascot, but I don't know any special history behind him other than he's thoroughly entertaining to take photos of. <laughs> yeah, Sumo Sum- San is the uh, is the mascot of Hitachi Solutions America. He actually has a, an official title. What is that? Hold on, he, he is Hitachi the, he is, America. Yeah. So it's he, not a mascot in Hitachi Japan. I'm not sure. I just I don't uh, think so. I don't think I don't think so. It's the Hitachi Solutions, not not Hitachi uh, Hitachi all over. He's got a Facebook page. So you know, after you come to work for Hitachi Solutions, shortly after you receive a box in the mail, and it includes your own Sumo-san. And the idea is take it where you go, and um, people post it on the. So you can look up Sumo-san on Facebook, and so you'll see my uh, our colleague Scott Sewell, Captain Red Laces, as we like to call him, takes many pictures of Sumo-san. And Parts. I got a picture of him in in Tokyo, and it's, it's just a it's just a cool thing that I actually dedicated the uh, second edition of the of the CRM Field Guide to Sumo San as well. He's a, he's the ambassador of fun <laughs> for Hitachi Solutions, and and you know what? It's it's crazy when you go into a client and you you have a Sumo San and you give it to them, they get so excited. They I mean they literally are happy that you gave them this little. Cushy uh, action figure. How could so. you not be happy with a big grin like that? Like he's I the, know, right? 
Yes. He's just he's so welcoming. My sumo son almost died when uh, after I opened the box, my dog attempted to use him as a chew toy. Okay, you did get you ended up getting a new Fitbit. Yes, I did. My dog. my dog ate my Fitbit, so I tweeted. I I, I sent a tweet in, uh, to the Fitbit support people, and they they sent me a new one. So yeah, my dog has destroyed that several is cool. things. Wayne, again, thanks for joining us. And as I mentioned before, I think you did a did a very good job at at kind of cutting the confusion. So can you tell me, without using the word call center, can you tell me what is the USD really? Sure. It's Microsoft's software that helps integrate lots of different line of business applications into a single user interface so a user doesn't have to jump all over the world trying to solve a problem. Okay. So what does so, but what does what does that really mean? I mean, I hear I hear integration, I hear what how is that different than say the XRM what I would consider the XRM approach to integrating data with CRM? Well, a big part of it is the fact that you have a fat desktop application which gives you a lot more hands-on with what you can do from the user side. It's especially useful if you have a lot of systems you can't easily integrate or uh, maybe you have an integration plan, but it's going to be many years in the migration process. Then the Unified Service Desk is a place where you can say, hey, these applications need to still work together. The user still needs to get to the data quickly. So how do we get those four or five applications that the user has to use uh, together quickly and efficiently? So that's uh, that's where it really comes into play. Uh, it's a lot different than just integrating data because maybe it's data you don't want to integrate. Maybe there's actually regulations that say these databases must be separate for security purposes. But you still need to be able to access them as certain users. Wouldn't it be correct to say that USD integrates at the user experience level? I think that's a fair way to say it, yeah. So, I mean, let's, let's get specific. So if I have like three different applications, I'll give you a real world, world type example. An insurance company that is growing by acquisition where insurance company one buys insurance company two and their, their, their catalog of business, they've now got two separate customer systems for billing and things like that, that uh, they're people who work in their admin groups and their underwriting groups need to be able to access this. And, you know, it's not always easy to just integrate them together. So as I understand it, if I'm using something like USD to orchestrate the systems, I can have it where I make a change in one make something else happen in the other system. That's part of it, uh, but it doesn't just have to be that. It could be that you make a change in one and it drives a new pop-up from another system to say, hey, I don't need to make a change in that system, but I need to be able to see the data that's in that system quickly because of the change I made. So it doesn't just have to be I push data between things. It could be what's the next action that the user needs to take. Oh, it's in that system. I know that because USD said so. So it's acting as a as an application quarterback. Yeah, very much so. In fact, uh, the the genre that it's a part of is called orchestration software because that's what it's doing is it's orchestrating all those other pieces of software the user needs to access. And and Sean gets a prize for our first sports metaphor of the show. And I would be the one to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Next, he'll, he'll say something is the data goalie. Exactly. I might have to do some World Cup uh, metaphors then, considering the Women's World Cup starts today. USA, USA. <laughs> <laughs> here's here's a question. This is something that has been a big mind shift for me, not only USD, but also Parature and Dynamics Marketing. Last week, George, you mentioned the XRM video, the, the cow management. We talked about corpse management and all this stuff. Back, Go back in the time machine to CRM 2011 days. The big message then was XRM basically CRM can be any line of business application you want. It doesn't matter what it is. And now with these acquisitions and move into, well, not doing away with XRM, supplementing it with, with actual line of business applications for marketing, and then with USD taking the approach of orchestrating different line of business systems, kind of the, you can't beat them, join them approach. Does USD compete with XRM or, or are they complementary? So from my perspective, they balance each other nicely. USD really is more of the front-end orchestration where your XRM, to me, is really going to be that best uh, not only line of business that you want for CRM, but also the back-end integrations that make all the CRM work. 
So balancing the two of those, you get a much more unified view. That 360 view that you know Microsoft's talked about forever, you get more of that 360 view of your customers than you would if you only had one or the other. Can you tell a bit more? Because uh, as far as I know, USD itself, to a large extent, is is configurable. So it's driven through a configuration. You can extend it, but uh, primary purposes. Um, make it configurable. And the entire USD configuration actually lives inside CRM itself. How how does it get installed in the first place? So Microsoft has an entire package installer for USD that helps deploy everything, all of your configurations and setup, both to the CRM instance that you're going to drive it from, but also out to the individual user desktops. But I don't think it's quite fair to say it's just configurable. It does have a lot of strong configuration inside of the CRM solution that it deploys with, but a lot of its power is the fact that it has a very well-defined SDK, so you can extend it out to other applications through development. My understanding is Microsoft is actually extending that configurability in the future, and I don't know the details on that, but I do know that's one of their goals, is to reduce the scope of how much you do develop right now and expand the scope of configuration, but I definitely wouldn't say it's there yet. Right. And one of, one of the things that I think is interesting is how the, the kind of a ripple effect that this has had in that we, we've seen some of the things that are coming into CRM now started from the USD. Same thing with Dynamics Marketing. The new navigation in CRM came from their investment in Dynamics Marketing. I think the ecosystems and the platforms uh, you know, get better together that way. And, and I, I, when I, they go, when, when they go to downloads, uh, I don't see USD SDK. What I see, however, is this uh, UII SDK. Can you, can you tell us a bit more about the relationship between UII and USD? What is what? I mean, all these three letters acronyms. Yeah, it's a little bit confusing there. So the UII is kind of the user is the user interface part of things, and it's a very specific uh, subset of what goes on with a unified service desk. So I would consider it part of the USD, but not all of the USD. So like if you actually got and if you actually got Oh, downloaded that UII SDK, you'll notice there's parts in there that also has an entire unified service desk developer guide on top of the UII developer guides. The USD developer guides also include stuff like the HAT, which is another one of those three-letter acronyms, and that's for Hosted Application Toolkit. And that is the part of USD that is how you add third-party applications, either ones that you've built or ones that you need to integrate, like the line of business ones we were talking about. And so the UII is only a subset of that, and then the broader scope of the hat and hosted controls and applications and all that other stuff that you can start integrating is really where the USD as a whole comes into play with the SDK. But it is a little bit confusing that if you download it, it's called the UII SDK. But uh, I, I always believe that uh, USD itself is built on UII and it's extended. So it's it is confusing, but UII is um, user um, interface. Um, what, user integration uh, I- interface. Yeah. Uh, yeah, user integration interface. Oh, interface integration. Right. That's sorry. what it is. User interface integration is DK. And it's very raw. It's like assembler of, uh, you know, user interface uh, integration. And it's just too complex. And it doesn't have configura- configura- configurability of uh, USD. So USD was built using UII. SDK and USD included A, usage CRM as a storage, B, extensibility specific to uh, taking it one level up specific to user interface rather than uh, generic construct specific to say uh, application extensibilities uh, like Windows applications and so on, what's not. And I think USD includes like reference CTI implementations and so forth. So it takes it a bit one level up. It's still based on the UII. Um, so my, my understanding, that's how it works. So when, when you work in, yeah, 
uh, if you want to go low level, like assembler level, then you go to UII. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, you would extend at a bit higher level, at visual basic level of uh, uh, interface construction, which is USD, sort of taking take an abstraction one, one level higher, making it easier to extend. Joe mentioned uh, that if you don't have third-party applications to integrate with, then USD has no value. I, that's not that's not exactly what I was saying. I'm I, exaggerating. I, I was reading Wayne's wonderful blog post, which I'll post on our podcast summary. One of the parts I found good was the discussion around where you should and not where you shouldn't use it, but where it has the most value. And there's parts specific to some place. And we were talking with the call center example. The our orchestration with other systems is one thing. That's not the only thing. The other thing that I mentioned was the multi-sessioning, uh, you know, where you need to have call center, somebody working on multiple uh, multiple cases or multiple calls simultaneously. Uh, the, the real value that we're seeing is that it's it this, the ability to handle multi, multiple sessions simultaneously, where we have you know three calls going on at the same time, kind of thing. That's another area where it's strong. What I was mentioning is I have, I, for example, I've had a client that's looked at it that has had not necessarily call center but has had more of a traditional administration type role where they really work on one at a time, don't have the multiple sessions, have more of the, I would call, traditional XRM approach. And, and to that, the USD had less value than the case I mentioned that has multiple sessions or the orchestrated integrated systems. Again, not not blanket statement. Some power users I've found, if you got if you got a user that needs to focus and do a task very quickly, the benefit in the UI in, in the USD as well is that for CRM it can it can scale down the U, the the user interface in CRM so you don't have all the menus and everything. It's more limited to just what they're doing versus a power user that is more comfortable just navigating through the normal UI of CRM. I mean, George, that's that's my take on it. Would you would you feel free to to um, disagree or <laughs> give your thoughts? Well, it's it's very hard to disagree uh, because you just uh, taken what I was saying and I'm taking what Wayne in, said in his, his excellent blog post actually incorporated <laughs> into your speech. Uh, but uh, one of the things people tend to forget, uh, yeah, this multi, multi tabbing, keeping the context is very important because CRM went, remember in 2011, people complained about a huge number of tabs that just keep opening. You can't stop the, the dialog boxes, tabs, and it's tabs, tabs, tabs everywhere. So try to manage that. Uh, CRM 2013 went the other way and saying, oh, it's all nice single page application. Now people saying, well, that doesn't work either because I need to work with multiple customers. Uh, I don't want to lose the context. And USD actually takes a great care of that, managing uh, tabs and sub-tabs, and that part is configurable. So you can manage tabs and, tabs and sub-tabs and maintain this context and switch very, very quickly. The other bit that I think when... Um, did write a lot about that is how applicable it is in call center situations. And to me, not only because of this switch in the context or CTI integration, but also about this wonderful thing that uh, people ask, been asking for a long time, call scripts. It's really interesting that when CRM came out, I remember like in CRM four days, people saying, oh, what about CTI? What about call scripts? I've got the call center. I need, I must have call scripts. Oh, we don't have, oh, you don't have call scripts. Now call scripts came out and you talk to the same people and say, now we have call scripts. And people go like, meh. <laughs> you know, but they're very important. Like ability for the, uh, when you do run a large call center, ability to have uh, prescri uh, prescript uh, prescriptive guidance is uh, quite important and uh, ability to enter uh, activities like notes and activities handle them very very quickly CT uh, the uh, USD does provide surface for that as well and I, I like it I like it um, I'd recommend anybody who is working in our industry 
and is is trying to sell CRM to a call center to get them to let you sit in for an hour with the call center and watch what they do, you will have a headache and your your eyes will be spinning afterwards because those people, people are good at it, and and we all we all say bad things about telemarketers, but people are good at it. That's a real skill because they have calls coming in, you know, the minute they hang up, another one comes in and they're expected to put notes in and you quickly get an appreciation for the demands of that environment. It's a totally different world than you or I or a salesperson or somebody like that leisurely going through CRM. And I know Wayne, I've been with you when we've we've done some of those things. Uh huh. Yeah, they're they're quite interesting, and it's different in different parts of the world too. Like I went to Korea and did some call center work there, and the how they were using it was even more dramatic than what I've seen in some of the user uh, the uh, U.S. call centers. It's pretty wild. But uh, for support based call centers, some of the stuff we were talking about earlier uh, also works well with uh, Parature integration and. So that helps a lot of the uh, those streamlines and actually that prescriptive stuff we were talking about. Uh, that's also very useful there. Yeah, and probably the most most memorable one I had was for a hearing aid company, and so it was I sat in with their call center and it was it was uh, an hour of people calling in for hearing appointments that were hard of hearing. So imagine like the most crazy scenario for a uh, call center. And uh, everybody was saying, you know, they'd have to repeat themselves. They'd have to yell into the phone. Wayne, can you tell a bit about what kind of systems um, you guys integrated USD uh, with, uh, or rather, what kind of CRM with uh, using USD? Uh, just, just samples, like variety of uh, CTI. Yeah, okay, CTI is kind of almost out of the box. So uh, telephony. So you've got screen pops and what's not. So when the call comes in, there's detection of the number. If number is detected, looks up, uh, looks it up and pops up the customer record and dialing out. You've got customer record. You push the button, call uh, um, system dials out, uh, connects you to the customer and creates a, a phone call record in CRM at the same time. That's fine. But what are what are the examples of other systems you integrated uh, with CRM using USD? Like Win32 apps, web applications, mainframe, I don't know. What so, can you tell us about that? So it's a lot of it has been a lot of legacy internally built applications, stuff that was built on Visual Basic years and years ago, maybe even older than that. But it's definitely a Win32 app that has been around forever that there's probably a migration you know, a migration plan around somewhere, but you know, the your your users still need it now. So that's been a really common one. It's just those custom, custom built apps that nobody really has a good grasp on. Nobody can keep up to date, but they can't abandon it yet. That's when you the, integrate, can you actually exchange the data with that application? Like, can you push the buttons? And if say, for simplicity's sake, if you have a calculator, ancient mm-hmm. specific insurance value life expectancy calculator, um, and you need to enter like five values and then the push calculate button and read the uh, the uh, output back can you can you actually do that with win32 apps and usd definitely uh, in fact that's where the hosted application toolkit comes into play it has the ability to integrate an interface with win32 apps web applications and even java applications so pretty much anything you could throw at it oh, and it also even has the ability to do some green screen stuff um, I haven't gotten too deep into some of the green screen integration, but you can emulate keystrokes and that kind of stuff if you want to go to the effort. But with Win32 apps and web apps, it's relatively straightforward because you have an inspector tool in the hosted application toolkit that can actually tell you what kinds of button clicks you need to emulate to make data work on those to, in those applications. So that becomes a very useful way to either push data from the CRM system in there or to automate steps that you need to get a result from. So I've seen it very common to use like the call scripting part of USD to capture the data you need from an incoming caller, then have that data pushed to your legacy app. The legacy app does its calculation. You emulate the submit button there, and it brings the data back to CRM. So CRM now has the calculation being done on the legacy application, but it's keeping the data exactly in the CRM system where you need to have it going forward. 
So that's been a super useful way to uh, handle that, and it's definitely possible through USD. Excellent. Um, but, gentlemen, did you notice that the history repeats itself? When I look at new things that come in through, uh, I can't help myself but think that we already have that. Like, take, for example, this USD screen scraping comes to mind. Call. That was like ages ago when I, last time I did screen scraping from the green screens, right? Um, I even used 3270 emulator to, to do this screen scraping. But then you think about other things like Azure, Azure storage and, oh, you have a better example, um, Amazon Glacier. It's archive storage. I right. used to and, carry and Azure, tapes around. Azure is like s- s- sharing server time. <laughs> kind of. So, mm-hmm. yeah, 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 what's, yeah. what's old and new again? Yeah, exactly. Wayne, this has but, been very, very, very insightful. I think we're coming to the end, but I really appreciate you coming on. I'll put a link to in the notes to your blog post. I recommend everybody go and read that. And um, this has been a great discussion, and I think it's cleared up. I, I know I've, I've learned things from it, and just working with Wayne on some projects where we've gone through it, he's really helped me clarify you know, my thinking around USD, and it really is more than a more than a call center. Well, thanks Very for having cool. me on. This was quite fun. Yeah, I like uh, I like uh, Wayne. Um, thank you very much because I personally like the the term. Uh, I'm not sure if you invented it, uh, but uh, I like the definition of USD as orchestration uh, software. I'll uh, pretend to take so credit for it. Just make sure <laughs> you credit Wayne Walton when you say that. Exactly, <laughs> trademark Wayne Walton and, and Sumo San. <laughs> Okay, well, guys, um, we've reached the end of the podcast, but before we go, I think we have some unfinished business from last week. Um, Going back in our podcast, Time Machine, we were talking about OneNote, and I believe I said something to the effect of, wouldn't it be great to send CRM, uh, to integrate CRM with OneNote and be able to send content from CRM to OneNote? And, And you all basically jumped on me and said, oh, don't you know you can do that? And I believe the direct quote from from Sean was, um, I believe you're the one person on this podcast that can't do that, Joel. Yeah, that was that was what I said. <laughs> and so I still stand. I still stand by. It. And so after and 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 my response was yes, you can kind of, but it's not really usable. So after the podcast, I uh, I challenged my my fellow host to actually try it, and uh, and what was the results, guys? Okay, I so, have no idea. I haven't tried it. <laughs> so, <laughs> The the control that's normally there for uh, send to OneNote, it wasn't there. Okay, <laughs> all right. But you know, a, I was able to get a screen into OneNote. Yes, you can you can you can do it. You can hit print. But what you get is you don't get the whole screen, and it's the same thing you get if you just took a screenshot. It doesn't. The text yes. isn't usable. So I I believe that I was right in that you can send a screenshot, but it's not usable. You can't, when I think usable in OneNote, you can use the text, you can search for it. You can see the whole web page if you clip it. None of that applies here. So would you like to uh, recant your statements I, from last week? No, because if, if you remember, and you said exactly what I said, I never said it was going to be usable. <laughs> I said you're going to be able to do it. So to that, I I maintain my uh, my statement. But look at it this way, Joe. Um, if you do, um, if you use a product like Snagit and you do a scroll in Windows capture, right? You will be able to capture it as a, as a printout. Then you paste it into OneNote, and then you use OneNote ability to do a character recognition, and you convert it back to text. Okay, if, if, yeah. if the conversation has been, can I use a Snagit scrolling uh, web page capture <laughs> and uh, paste it in? That's one thing. That was not the, that was not the integration we were discussing. I, I will no, not give no, you that, of George. Not. Of course not. Uh, but uh, I'll, I'll come up by the next podcast. I'll come up with something that feeds your CRM data into one note. So expect to see the George Dubinsky uh, one note uh, CRM integration button by next week. You heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, and it's going to be mine, not Sumo Sam. Exactly. 
<laughs> so so what's uh, what's on tap for next week, Joel? I think uh, what we're going to try to do next week is uh, get some more serum news at the beginning of the podcast. We're also going to try and line up some special guests. Uh, I heard that George is traveling. Are you traveling to uh, the Microsoft HQ this next week? Yes, I'm, uh, uh, I'm going to be um – Come Monday, I'm going to be sitting in uh, Advanta, which is uh, heart of uh, CRM development. Where the magic happens. So, yeah, yeah. So, so definitely we plan on trying to line up another guest for next week and uh, other other relevant topics. Also, we would love to get some questions. Uh, if anybody listening to the podcast has any questions or topic suggestions, you can email those to voice at crm.audio as well. Yeah, yeah we, we still have a couple of topics that we wanted to discuss uh, about uh, uh, have some closure on uh, Facebook forums and uh, what they're good for. The other is um, I, I like the idea of uh, CRM online versus on-prem. Maybe we can do like a, a boxing match in the in, in the <laughs> round red by corner. round and, and go yeah, ten rounds. Yeah, yeah. I'm, you, I'm you throw in your SSRS re- SSRS reporting, and I I rejoin with the left uppercut with Power BI. There you go. There you go. Yeah, that that uh, that that would be a good one. So we, we just need to uh, decide who's the referee, who's who's playing for Sharam online, and who's playing for Sharam on premise. It'll be uh, bigger than. Uh, Mayweather Pacquiao. <laughs> so I'm thinking like on premise would be like the old George Foreman or something. Yeah. <laughs> as long with, as with the grill. <laughs> yeah. As as long as uh, as long as online isn't uh, Tommy Morrison, I think we're fine. No, o- online online it will be a um, badass uh, featherweight. It's, there you go. All right, let's figure that out. That sounds like a good. Well, that sounds in, like a good in that idea. case. In that case, you definitely need to be online. You could do the voice of the of the guy in Rocky Four. I must break you. <laughs> <laughs> this has been CRM Audio, the Microsoft Dynamic CRM podcast. You can hear previous episodes on our website, crm.audio. Subscribe to our podcast on iTunes. Follow us on Twitter at CRM Audio or leave us a comment on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash CRM podcast. If you have any topic suggestions or questions that you would like for us to answer on a future episode, please drop us an email at voice at crm.audio. Special thanks to Dale Simmons for our theme music. Go check out his website, dalesimmons.com. Please join us next time on CRM Audio.